Welcome everybody to tonight's home clinic. A home clinic is where we grab one quality coach and he presents on one specific subject for you guys to enjoy and he usually does that from home. If you guys have been enjoying this series and would like to see it continue, uh, we wanna ask that you would like and subscribe below. Those things certainly help us to grow and is kind of that feedback to say this is, yeah, this is a good thing, keep this coming. If you have a desire to present in the future, reach out to us on Twitter, DM us, that's at Chief at the Chief Pigskin. All right, without further ado, tonight's home clinic. Hey, what's up, Chief Pigskin? This is Coach Blair again. I'm here for some option talk with Coach Sean Reinhart at Lakeview High School in uh, Michigan. Um, so how are we doing today, Coach? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Awesome having you. Awesome having you. So anytime we get a guy on here and talk option, I like to ask him this question. Why do you decide to run, and you in, in particular, the split back beer? You know, I think, and it's something we're going to touch down when I get to the presentation, but, you know, I think it's something that's different that teams aren't really expecting. They're not really used to it. Um, you see a lot of option football in today's game, but it's usually flex bone, uh, pistol, some kind of spread option look. Um, we're going to give you something completely different, and we're going to hit really fast when we do it. And, and the bottom line here at Lakeview, our kids just absolutely love it. Um, they have bought into being different, um, and it shows. Awesome, awesome. I think it's so – so cool, and I'm very excited to listen to you talk about the split back here. So give everybody kind of a, a preview of what it is you're going to discuss in your presentation. I mean, it's going to be the basics of, of wanting to run the split back beer. Beer outside beer, uh, our cutback play, some counter option, and then uh, two or three play action passes that are, are pretty prominent in what we do and how we do it. Um, just the basics for if you're, you were someone that was – interested in wanting to run it and put it in this these would be the basics that you would want to understand before you went ahead and did that awesome so you go ahead share your screen the floor is yours all right fantastic this is attacking the defense with the split back beer uh, my name is sean reinhardt i'm the head football coach at lakeview high school in lakeview michigan which is about uh, 45 minutes north of grand rapids michigan um, that's my email and, and our twitter handle if you are interested in getting some more information if you want to reach out you know anytime you feel you want to get some more information please don't hesitate to ask um, so why the split bag beer? Um, I ran it for a few years when I coached in North Carolina. I moved up to Lakeview High School in Lakeview, Michigan in 2013, and, and I brought it with me just for these reasons. Um, it hits very quickly, um, just like a lot of option offenses hit very quickly. Split bag beer hits incredibly fast, and we'll talk about how deep our running backs are in our system uh, behind the line of scrimmage, our splits, our alignment, things like that. But we hit very quickly. There are plays that we have, some complementary plays that um, are designed, like our power play, to kind of hit on the perimeter, hit a little bit slower. But, but our option game is going to hit fast, and it's going to make defenses think. Um, we feel like it gives us the best chance to win because it is different. It's something that teams don't necessarily see all the time. Um, in our conference right now, there are no other teams that, that run the option. Um, we don't play anybody that is non-conference that runs the option. We are one of the few schools in our area, really at all, that run it this way. Um, we feel like it helps us control the clock, um, which helps us defensively. We're a small school with about 325 kids at our high school. Um, so our, our team could have anywhere from 29, 30 kids to 20, 21. So we want to make sure that we give our kids the best chance to get some air, some oxygen. And we want to make sure we're putting our best kids in our best places because a lot of these kids that we have, are not only playing special teams, they're playing offense, and they're playing defense. They're never really coming off the field. So we got to make sure we put them in the best chance they can. Um, we feel like opponents need extra practice time to stop us. Um, you can't – it's not like a normal offense that you might see. We have at least three or four schools on our schedule and in our conference that run the exact same offense. Um, so you're almost preparing for them when you're preparing for the same team that next week. So with us – you need some extra practice time to stop us. There has to be something in your defensive session that is going to talk about, you know, playing that style of football and making sure you have your assignment, you understand your assignment, and, and you're rolling with that. And, and that takes extra practice time. Um, very few teams run this version. I don't know of very many split bag rear teams in Michigan. There's, there's one or two other ones. Um, you know, I've talked to a lot of the split back beer teams across the country. There's not many of us. Um, and, and I think and the kids here at Lakeview have really bought into that fact. They, they like being different. They enjoy that. Uh, we feel like it works with any type of athlete. 
it doesn't really matter what you have. Um, small linemen, larger linemen, um, small running backs, larger running backs. I've had them all, and they can all be successful. Um, this isn't a system that requires a certain type of kid. It can work with any kid. Um, when I was in North Carolina in 2009, we moved to a split back beer, and the school I was at had 1,200 kids. And then you compare that to this school that I'm at now that only has a little over 300, and, and it works with any type of kid, any type of school. Um, there's no timing motions like with other option offenses. So the flex bone, the pistol often require that, that motion, that orbit motion, that back motion, the counter look. Um, that's a lot of timing. And, and that takes extra practice time to make sure your kids have that timing and you're in the right spot. We don't really have to worry about that. As far as our pitch relationship, we, we teach our running backs to tighten up or to widen out depending on their speed and their first step. But we don't really have to worry about those timing motions. We can teach the pitch relationship when we're teaching the dive relationship. There doesn't need, we don't have the separate A backs and the B backs. We just have running backs. Um, but just like any other offense, I'm sure there's, there's, there's cons to what we do, but that's one of the things that we feel like is one of our pros. We don't have to worry about those timing motions. And then we feel like it's easy to teach and easy to learn. Um, our kids really take to it. Uh, this is a slideshow I've shared with them that we talk about as a team all the time. Um, and we try to keep things incredibly simple, similar blocking schemes, similar pass protections, things like that. Initial coaching points, if you are someone who wanted to install this, uh, because it's not easy at first. Um, all these high school kids are seeing college football and they're seeing people throwing for three, 4,000 yards a year. Um, they're seeing everybody spread it out. And now then you want to come in and you want to tighten everybody up and have either one receiver or two or three. Um, and so these are the things that, that we kind of talk about at Lakeview High School and why we do what we do. Um, the the buy-in can be difficult. We're 80% run, 20% pass. That fluctuates depending on year. Um, this past year, we were about 85% run and 15% pass. Um, it changes depending on athletes. Who do you have? Um, if we have really good receivers that block really well, but might not be able to, to catch very well, we're going to put them at tight end. Um, but if we have a few athletes that we, we know can run a little bit, run some routes, they can block and they can catch, then we're going to have more receivers and we're probably going to throw the ball more. Um, I feel like your coach's passion for what you're doing and early successes can earn the buy-in from the high school athletes. These kids here at Lakeview know <clears throat> that I love this offense. Um, they know that I won't do anything else. And they know I'm committed to getting really good at it and learning about it. You know, I've been coaching it. I've been the head coach here for seven years. Um, I coached this offense in two years in, in 2009 and 2012 in North Carolina. Um, so I have a lot of experience in it, but I'm still learning. I still call coaches. I still want to hear from them. I want to watch presentations. I want to learn what they're doing. Um, and, and I can tell that my passion for it is rubbing off on them and they get excited about it. Um, three and a half yards per carry is the goal. And we talk about that every day. You know, you're only trying to get three and a half yards. If we do that three times, we're going to get a first down. Um, and, and I've been told by other people that, you know, when they watch us play, they're amazed at all the big plays that, that we have in our system because option offenses don't usually have 50, 60, 65, 70 yard plays. We have those plays because of our kids' commitment to the three and a half yard per carry goal. We're going to get three and a half yards every single time. Um, even at practice, we'll, we'll have a great run during a team period. We'll bring that ball back to three and a half yards past and we'll keep going. Um, just so they have that mindset. You know, that was a good one, but we got we to gotta have that three-and-a-half-yard mindset. Uh, we tell our receivers, no block, no rock. If you can't block in our system, we can't trust you to throw you the ball. All right, blocking is an incredible, pivotal part for our system. Um, we don't change blocking schemes an awful lot like you see with a flex bone team that might switch responsibilities so that receiver would go to the safety, um, that, uh, that place at A-back might go to the corner. We don't do that. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll switch our tight end and our receiver, but it's rare. Um, so really our receivers are stock blocking 90% of the time. And there's an art form to that. That's not something I can't just tell that kid run over there and, and block that corner. You know, there's an art form to, to coming off the ball and sticking the hips and getting in front and, and maintaining leverage. Um, but we spend, a, we spend a lot more time on blocking than we do on catching because our route system and our passing game is so easy to comprehend 
that we spend a lot of time on blocking. And this last thing I actually stole, I know Coach Mallory did one of your guys' videos a little while ago, and I took this from him. He said, only dead fish go with the flow. So, and I told the kids that, you know, because we want to be different. And, and the split bag is old, but it, right now it is different. And, and doing something different can always have people question why you're doing it. But when they buy into it and they realize, you know, this is different, but it's hard for teams to stop when we do it really well. Um, the kids really buy into it and get excited about it. Um, teaching the why. I actually adapted this from JT Curtis High School in Louisiana um, when we were first learning about this in 2009. I really like the method at which they, they teach, you know, why do we do what we do? Why do we run this? Uh, and this is what I tell the kids on day one when we get in there, and especially now, um, not really having access to the kids once we actually get back in there, you know, this will be the first thing we talk about. You know, we control nine to 10 of the 11 men they have on the field before every single play. And then we tell the kids that we dictate their movement. And this is really powerful for us. And so here's how it really breaks down. So when we line up, we, we know right off the bat as a coaching staff, as a team, that we control nine to 10 of the 11 players they have on the field. We know that because they have to play assignment football. So the four techniques and the linebackers that I have highlighted in yellow, all right, you can change your dive and your, your pitch responsibilities. But when you walk on the field, somebody has to have the quarterback. Somebody has to have the dive player. Somebody has to have the pitch player. And so we can walk on the field and get a pretty good sense of who that's going to be. So in this example, our two four techniques and our linebackers could possibly have dive. The six techniques in this example – when we play this type of defense, a 52, tend to have the QB. So you've got six guys already accounted for that have the dive in the QB. One of the safeties is more than likely, 90% of the time, going to have pitch. It doesn't matter where we run the ball. We know we're unbalanced because we have a tight end over here. We understand that. But it doesn't matter where we run the option. One of those safeties is more than likely going to come down and take pitch. We rarely, in our system – or at our school in our conference, see a corner take pitch. But even if that happens, somebody has to now take that corner's responsibility. So just judging from what we see all the time, that safety is probably going to come down to take pitch, one of them. So now we pretty much control what those guys do. And if that's the case, then the corners are going to take their deep thirds or, or, or play man if it's cover one. The other safety is going to play his deep middle, whether it's cover three or cover one. So the only one that we really don't have control over is the nose. And we know that walking into a game that we have to control him. If this were like a 4-3, then we know we have to control that middle linebacker. He's the one that might not have a responsibility. Now, we understand and we teach this all the time that teams can flip their responsibilities pretty easily. Um, we've seen this in the past where all five down linemen, the six, the four, the nose, four, and the six, had, all had dived. And somehow their quarterback players were their two inside linebackers and the pitch player didn't change. It was the strong safety or the free safety. They just rolled when we ran option one way or the other. Um, but we put plays in our system to help us determine what teams are trying to do. We have plays that look like option where they're not really option, but we carry out that fake to allow us to figure out where you are and identify who your quarterback player is, who your dive player is, who your pitch player is. This is really powerful for high school kids to see because when you're first teaching it, they have, they have a lot of concerns about, well, now not only do I have to run this, but now I got to read them and I have to understand what they're doing when they would much rather just take a hand off and go. But once they understand why you're reading it, and that once you know you control nine to 10 of their 11 guys and we're only blocking usually nine of them, that is really powerful for 15, 16, and 17, 18 year old kids to hear. Um, really helps sell what you're doing. And, I, and in my opinion, having them understand the why is way more important than their ability to do it. They need to understand why they're doing it before you can get them to successfully do it at all because you're asking like these running backs to sprint 100 miles an hour at the line. They want to know why they're doing that and have an understanding of what's going to happen once they get past that line. These are our formations. 
Um, these are our base formations. Let me preface that. We have some other ones. Um, these are the ones that we use more than anything. Uh, pro and con is just a two receiver, one tight end set. Um, I think I have examples of all these in some film later too. Um, east and West, we call that when we have twins. So you have, if it's East, you'd have two receivers to the right and a tight end to the left. West would be opposite. East open and West open is our three receiver set. It's where we either have our tight end come off the field and a third receiver steps on, or what we've done for most of the years I've been here at Lakeview, all three, so two receivers and one tight end, that tight end just bumps out to a slot receiver. Uh, we don't have a tight end. East over and West over is when we go unbalanced and our tight end goes with our twins. And then probably the number one formation we ran this past year is we call it Canadian right and left. It's our two, it's two tight ends and one receiver. And you'll see some examples of these as we get to some film here in a little bit. These are the base run plays that we have in our system. It looks like a lot. Um, the ones that are in bold are the ones that I'll cover today. Um, so if you're out there and you're listening and you're interested in like midline and speed option and QB follow, um, you know, I'm more than happy to share that information. I will preface that by saying some of these plays we don't run get on a given year. If we have kids that don't pull very well, then we're not probably going to run power and we're not going to run counter tray. Um, if we have running backs that don't have a, a great deal of speed, uh, we're probably not going to run a whole lot of 18 and 19 quick pitch. Um, you know, but we're going to run those QB follow, the speed option and midline, things like that. Um, the bold ones are just, so I chose cut back inside beer, outside beer, and counter option because, you know, those, those first three are the three, the first three that we teach here at Lakeview. It doesn't matter how many years they've been running it. Our youth program runs a split back beer. Um, but those are the first three that we're going to put in. We're going to make sure they get that right before we move to anything else. And that counter option play I chose because it's not very common to see a counter option that, like we do. And, and I wanted to share it so you guys had a, an example of, how you can get a counter, it looks like a flex ball counter option, a counter look out of something like a split back set. These are the base pass plays that we have. Um, we do try to keep it pretty simple. So the ones again in bold are the ones that we're, I'll talk about a little bit. Um, 134, 135 slant, and I'll get to what the hundreds mean here in a little bit. Um, 234, 235, ride pass, high pass, slow go. Um, we do have a drop back system. We call it 90s and we try to keep it really basic. So 95 just tells the lineman that nine tells them it's a drop back pass. Five tells the QB that it's a five step drop. And then the combo would come after it. And our pass combos are NFL teams. So I would just call the formation and then say 95 lion. Um, 93 is just a nine is the pass. Nine is the, that it's drop back. Three is the three step drop. 90 just tells the QB he's taking a snap and he's throwing it like a bubble. Uh, we do have a boot. We do have a sprint out. We have a, a pretty big screen game. So we have jailbreak brick screens. We have slot screens. We have running back screens out of our inside veer look. Um, we have found that screens, especially with the kids that we have, um, are, are really important for our game and how we do things. Um, so the first play is cutback. So basically cut back, and again, this is adapted from JT Curtis. This isn't a play that, that we came up with ourselves. So um, cut back is one of the best plays that we have in our system. It's generally the first play that, that we're going to run in a game. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, cut back is designed to, to get you a look at linebackers and to also help you figure out what the defense is trying to accomplish and who their assignments are. It looks exactly like inside veer as far as the action that you get in the backfield. And when you teach this, the, the best part about this play is it is blocked almost exactly like inside of here, like 34, like we call it 34 and 35 inside of here. Um, the linemen don't have to change anything. So basically, and I'll flip back and forth between this slide and the assignment slides. But <clears throat> So the quarterback is going to take an 8-inch to 10-inch step while seating the ball. So he's going to take that snap. He's going to seat the ball on his outside hip, and he wants to make sure that he pulls it in. We have an issue with QBs that want to take that snap and immediately start swinging the ball out. They haven't pulled it into their stomach, their gut, and seated it, and so you can get fumbles that way. So it's a hard 8- to 10-inch step. We're trying to gain ground. That back foot is going to do a timing step where he's going to drag his back foot while reaching the ball out straight in front. 
Um, and he's doing that because once his back foot hits his front foot, that timing, that drag step, that tells him to carry out his fake because the ball should be gone. This play is an automatic give to the running back. There is no read on this play. And this is why we teach it first. This is why I bring it here first, because this is a great way to get your quarterback comfortable with the option system. Have him work on his eyes, has his eyes on a normal read if it were inside beer. It really helps him to alleviate some of that stress and pressure because there is no stress and pressure. You're just taking a small eight to 10 inch step, drag the back foot. You're going to ride it like it's inside veer, give the ball, and then carry out your fake with the pitch back. When the back foot touches play side foot, ball should be gone and carry out your fake. Do not look at ball carrier. We have that all the time. Our kids always want our quarterback and our pitch guy always want to stop and they want to look back to see where the running back is. Well, you can't do that. We're trying to get these linebackers right here. We want them scraping. We want them moving because we want to cut back right behind them. And if you stop, you're, you're not selling the advantage. It's like the old T that we, the full house T that we see an awful lot here on the west side of the state of Michigan. <clears throat> you know, those teams really, really carry out their fakes well. And so we want to be like that. We want to carry out those fakes so that we're trying to get those guys outside. Running backs for their three-point, they are in a three-point stance. Um, we're a little different. We put a little bit more weight forward than most. Um, we want them to be like human rockets. We want them to go. On this play, we're going to line up just inside our guards, both of them. So the, we call it the R-back and the L-back. They're going to straddle the inside legs of the guards. Um, if you're the R-back and it's 30, so for well, the example that I have is 31. So if you're the L-back, you're going to take your – you're going to sprint down the line. It's a straight shot. On the second step, you're going to create a pocket. You're going to go up and over with your inside arm up. And we really work on that up and over. We don't want to throw our elbows out. We want to come up, over, create that good pocket. Once we feel the mesh, we, we soft squeeze on the ball. And we teach the option mesh, the soft squeeze with the palms open on cutback, just like we do on inside view and outside view. We don't want them... We know they're getting the ball, but if we let them just take it, then we know we're going to have issues with outside veer and inside veer. We don't want that to happen. On the third step, we're going to find that cutoff lineman. And in this defense right here, it's going to end up being our center. So on that third step, we're going to plant that outside foot, and we're going to cut off of this center's block off that nose. And we'll get to it in a little bit. That center really cannot be wrong with where he takes that nose, and, and centers always love hearing that. Um, the option or the, the backside back, the pitch back is going to have a hard pitch fake the other way. And we're going to sell it. We're not watching the ball here. And if that means you're running 10, 15 yards upfield with the QB, then that's awesome. I'm, I'm all about it. I want you upfield. Um, we do have our receivers. We, we make it very clear to them. You're going to see this a whole awful lot. Um, you're responsible for the corner. You're blocking for both the quarterback and the pitch. And we, we really talk about with our kids, who are you blocking for? So if you're the receiver, if you're the tight end, if you're the tackle, who, who are you blocking for? I mean, these kids are probably not blocking for the dive. They might be. But more than likely, they're blocking for the QB and the pitch player generally in a, in a pitch game or in an option play. Um, your willingness to hustle can lead to a long touchdown. You know, your, your willingness to get upfield, get a block, and maintain that block could, could really lead to a big play, and they often do. Um, so our – Offensive line assignments, and this is almost exactly like inside beer. And I'll start with the center. He's going to take a play side step. He's going to help that play side guard if necessary, if there's somebody on that guard. In the, in the defense that I just showed, the 52, he's still taking a play side step. He's going to block that nose. He has no other responsibility than that nose. So if that nose decides to slant play side, then he's going to take him play side, take him where he wants to go. If he angles backside, then we're going to take him backside. It's the running back's job to read the block of the center. The center cannot be wrong. The play side guard is going to take a play side step and get vertical. If he has to tell the nose, he will. Our backside or our play side guard is, or tackle is going to veer. He's going to veer for that linebacker. Our Every backside lineman that we have, so our backside guard and our backside tackle, they're going to do what we call a 45. They're going to run a 45-degree angle. Um, a lot of people think that that center's block is the most important. It's not. It's this block right here. 
It's the block of your backside tackle, his 45, because really his ability to get upfield and find the outside hip of that linebacker and really seal that off is going to determine whether you have a big play or not. Because realistically, it doesn't really matter where the center takes him, whether he angles this way, he slants strong side. I'm still going to end up as a running back probably right around here. Whether I go around you or whether I cut underneath like the diagram shows, I'm going to end up right in this vicinity, and I want to make sure I get to him and I get that seal. And we get a lot of questions about, well, what about these ends? You know, if these four techniques crash really hard, they might be able to get that. Well, they can, all right? But, but what, the, again, this play is doing is telling us, it's making the defense show their hand. If these tackles fly down the line of scrimmage hardcore, I'm pretty sure they have dive, and now I can call different plays because of that. If they fly up field, they, they probably don't have dive. They might have QB. But we can also play with our splits. We can wind these guys out. You'd be amazed at how often they, they don't see that backside running back cutting back to their side. And so sometimes we'll have our tackles go three and a half feet. And even when they veer or 45 to that backside, to that linebacker, this kid still doesn't see it coming, and we cut right underneath him and get upfield. So this is cut back. It's a different defense. But this is what cutback looks like to a 4-3. A so basically what we're going to do is his third step. Makes that good pocket right there. Could have been a little bit better, but he makes that pocket. You can see the quarterback. He takes his 8-10 to 10 inch step. He's going to drag that back foot. Notice his eyes. That QB eye is really important. He's not looking at our running back. He's still looking at that number 14. He's looking at, you know, that possible dive key. Our running back sees where he's supposed to go. And in this defense, we don't see a 4-3 much anymore. I don't know about teams out there that run this offense. We don't, we don't see it much. Um, I can explain really quickly what's going to happen. You know, that tackle is going to veer. We're going to base these two techniques out. We want to turn them outside. And then everyone else is going to linebacker. I will tell you our tight end that I forgot to explain to you in the diagram. Our tight ends, they three-step arc release, which you'll see him do here in a second. They three-step arc release on cutback, and they three-step arc release on inside veer. Um, they are to get vertical to a defensive back, to a safety. And they do that to set up the tight end pass that we have later on. So basically, he's going to take the handoff. He's going to find that cut hard, and he's going to get vertical. I mean, you can see from the play number, this is play seven. This is one of the first plays that we ran. We get a, a, a decent block on our receiver. who almost gets called for holding. Um, but we're going to feel – and you can you – can, what this does to a defense, teams don't really know we run this play. I mean, you can watch us on film. It looks – if you were someone who doesn't run this way back here, and doesn't have a whole lot of experience in it, you would assume this is inside fear because of the QB's eyes. He does a really good job selling it. And it's even more important in today's game because of huddle sideline and because of all these sideline replay systems. We have to make sure that we're not showing our hand and giving them a, a, a key to a play that's pretty big for us. You can even see right off the bat where the defense goes. The minute they snap the ball, you know, they're all flying to the left side, to that QB, to the pitch back. They don't even see the running back cut underneath. So this play is designed to hold those linebackers up because now they have to second guess themselves. I can't vacate too early because if I do, he's going to cut right back underneath me. Here's another example. This was a split four defense a few years ago. Same cut, super fast. And if sometimes it's pretty tight. You can kind of see him. I mean, he's, this is one of our better running backs we had. He's pretty quick off the ball, um, takes that step. If this isn't a huge cut, he doesn't have to cut all the way backside because he gets to here, and there is no cut the other way. So we talked about, you know, finding that backside tackle and the, the, the block is on his hip or on that linebacker hip. There isn't – that doesn't exist. So he's just going to take that cut, and now he's going to get vertical and read his block. We've got a tight end block there and a receiver block there. Inside veer is the next one. And again, it's an, it's an easy transition because inside veer and cutback are blocked the exact same way. We don't really change anything. The only changes really happen in the backfield. 
Um, so I'll even start with the lineman this time. It's the exact same thing. Our tackle is going to veer. We're going to veer that, that read key, which, is, which we'll get to here in a minute. Our center and guard are going to do what we call a combo. I know a lot of teams scoop this. So they might send that guard to linebacker and then scoop with your backside guard and center. We don't scoop at all. Um, and I think that's just because of where I came from, we didn't scoop. Um, but I think as I've progressed and we've been here for a long time, um, we have found that allowing these guys, these backside linemen to get vertical and run their 45, instead of having to scoop that nose, let the center get vertical, has allowed us to get to the second level pretty quickly. It does take some teaching to really teach these kids. You can't just tell them to run a 45 degree angle. Be amazed how many kids don't know what a 45 degree angle is. So we want to really make sure these kids understand, you know, take that hard step and then go. And as you sprint and you get out of the blocks and you go, if you see the back numbers of a jersey, leave it alone and continue to get vertical, don't stop. Um, for our quarterback, he's going to take another play side, eight to 10 inch step while seating the ball. Um, again, no different than cutback. It's no different than outside beer. Um, he's going to take a longer step. There's no dragging. There's no timing step in inside beer. So he's going to take a longer stride to the play side guard outside hit with the ball extended. We are not a point mesh team. We are a ride and decide. We're going to actually ride that mesh and we're going to make sure that QB makes a good decision. Um, he's going to reach the ball behind his shoulders and he's going to ride the mesh. We say put it on the table, all right, which means make sure it's right at the level where his up and over has created that running back's pocket. And we're going to put it on the table for that running back to run right through it. Um, we do tell him a rule that, that I don't think I'll ever change. Once the ball is slightly past your hip, it belongs to the running back. If you haven't made a decision by the time the ball goes from the back, your backside hip to your front side hip, he is taking it and he's not wrong. Um, reads for number one. He's going to give the ball unless number one comes down hard and flat in front of my running back. If number one attacks hard, I will pull the ball. Read for number two, I will pitch the ball unless number two denies it. If number two denies it, I will keep the ball and get upfield quickly. So in this defense right here, you know, we're going to – the dive key is the four technique. The pitch key is the end. Um, we do run this against this defense. The only issue you have is it is a very quick read because you have these two very close together. And our kids understand that. And if you're going to run this system, those – any kids – any QB needs to understand it, and the running backs need to as well. They have to know that because these two are so close together and we're not blocking either one of them, that the QB might have to pull this ball and pitch it very quickly. And if you're not ready for that, that causes a lot of fumbles. The only thing that can help is that because our tight end three-step arc releases, what we often see is an end that takes a step out a little bit. He actually goes with the tight end a little bit, and then – he might just stay home and take the QB or the pitch, but just getting a little bit more separation, more space can often help that relationship. Um, but that often happens very quickly. Um, the R back, the, the play side back is going to take a three point stance with some way forward. He's going to run as hard and fast as he possibly can. His aiming point is the outside hip of the guard and they're going to go. We actually have a drill here at Lakeview where we paint a practice field and put lines on a field. We have about, we're about – heels are at four yards from the ball. So we, we have this drill where we have about four yards of space between the running backs and a painted spot on the field, and we time them like their get off. So we do a cadence, we the down set go, and we time them from the time they get off to the time they get to that spot. Um, and we, we challenge them to improve that time. We want them to go. You don't want them to stand up. And they often want to stand up because they want to see what's happening. You don't need to see. Just go. All right? You should feel. And that's a, that's a huge part of this game is these kids need to, to trust their sense of feel more so than their vision, especially as a running back. You can get a good pre-read snap of what's about to happen in front of you, but you need to get a good feel for, for that mesh and, and where you're at on the field. Um, on that second step, create a pocket with your up and over and then soft squeeze on the ball. Um, when I say soft squeeze, you know, we're going to squeeze with our forearms. Our bottom hand is going to stay open. Um, once you pass the QB's hip, the ball is yours. Um, I know some teams, when they teach this, they teach the, the running backs over the guards, and then they have to read to either go straight or to cut. We don't do that. We just teach them to go, which we have found has given them more freedom. There is no decision for them to make. Just go. 
Just run as fast and hard as you possibly can. Um, the L back needs to make sure he's in pitch phase, four to five yards out, one yard behind, uh, mirror the QB, and he needs to go. And, and I will say if there's any drawback to this offense, what I hear from other people and what I've visually seen is the pitch back. You know, there's a lot of times when the QB wants to pitch it, but he can't see him because in a flex bone type system, he's already way over here by the time the, the mesh is taking place. So it's an easy step and pitch for that QB. So we really have to make sure that our backs know. We don't tell them where to go if they're the pitch back. I'm not going to tell my L back right here to line up over the guard or to straddle the inside leg. These guys need to get a good sense of here's how fast I am and where I need to be to get myself in pitch phase and make sure I'm not taking any negative steps. Just like in a sprint, if you're standing straight up in the air and you go to run a sprint, you back step and then you go. These kids want to do the same thing. They want to back step and then go. And so we try to eliminate that pretty quickly so we don't have those issues. This is our pro set, two receivers, one tight end. So you see our tight end arc release, our running back has to make a little bit of a cut there. But you can see how fast he is off the ball, pretty low, pretty hard. You see that second step, he really does the up and over. And, you know, the way we talk about it, it sounds like that, that mesh takes forever. It really doesn't. You can see his arms doing the up and over. Uh, notice where the ball is with the QB. See how the ball is behind his hip. Um, that's really important because if you don't start it there, then you're going to have less of a time to make that initial read. You really want to make sure you reach it back a little bit because once it passes the front hit, it belongs to the running back. It's his. And so we want to make sure that we, we give him time to make that good decision. So they continue to get vertical. Our tackle, sorry, our guard, he gets vertical because he's uncovered. That linebacker scrapes right here over the top because he sees option coming his way. So our guard does right and pushes him out the other way which creates a good seal for the running back to make a good move and get up field. These plays don't happen all the time. You know, he was a really good running back, made really good cuts, but if, nonetheless, he still would have gotten four or five yards on that play. This is Pro 34. This is the exact same play. Um, this is a, a modified split four. So they've got four, uh, two defensive linemen, two outside linebackers. He was stacked behind him. They walked him up because of what we're doing. Um, same exact play you just saw, just a different look out of it. This is a pull, and I put this on here because it is a good pull, but the issue is what he does after it. So our running back over here, and you can probably notice it, see how he's super slow off the ball? Like, we're already gaining ground. He hasn't even stepped yet, which is going to – very negatively affect the QB's ability to pitch because you really can't even see him. So instead of carrying the ball in his two hands like he should, prepared to pitch the ball, you see him just tuck it and go, which, which is great, but there's no reason why we can't keep that option relationship and get here and pitch that ball. And now we might even have a bigger play than we could have had right here. Same play again. This is Canadian left, so we have two tight ends. Um, this is actually a 52 defense, like we see in the diagrams. We're going down here to the right. Same issue with our backside running back. He needs to get a little more speed and go. Um, a good pull, though, as far as the mesh itself. So he reaches back. The 58 actually collapses. And you, you can see it, too. These running backs are pretty big. 58 does collapse. But even if we give that ball, we're still going to get three-ish yards. Get vertical, get upfield, find that green grass, and go. That's what we tell our QBs. Once you pull the ball, replace. So clear the path of the mesh, find the green grass, and go. This is inside here. This is 35. Again, same concept. We're going to arc release that tight end. We're going to veer this kid. He's the read. He's the pitch key. Good pull. Pretty good relationship right here. Um, he just chose to keep it. He was pretty athletic QB. 
Um, pretty good mesh at this point, too. Um, you can see his, his front foot, his right leg, really steps and sinks into the line, which is good. Um, really gets a deep mesh. I mean, you can see the mesh right there. And that, he gets upfield. This kid doesn't even know where the ball is. Get upfield and get vertical. Outside veer is probably one of our favorite plays that we do in our system. Um, it only changes a little bit as far as how we block it um, against a 52 type defense like we've been seeing. This is our number one go-to play uh, because there's only so many different ways that you can take the, the dive key, the pitch key, and the QB. So basically our QB is going to take the same 8 to 10 inch step while seating the ball. Um, the only change is, and this takes a lot of practice, he's going to run the ball to the opposite hip of the play side tackle. We're not going to two-step this because he'll only get to here. We're not going to step and drag because he'll only get here. He's going to step and run to get to that mesh. Um, we're not going to slow these guys down for him. We're going to really rep this, and it takes a lot of reps to get it right. Um, same, same mesh, reach that ball a little bit behind your outside shoulder and ride that mesh. Once the ball slightly past the hip, the ball belongs to the running back. So we teach the same mesh, but the issue is getting to that mesh point. We really practice getting hard to here because we're going to aim at the outside hip of the tackle. A lot of teams aim at the middle of the tackle. We don't do that because we, we want to make sure we create an angle to allow the, the back to really be in a full sprint. Outside veer is a nasty perimeter play if you can hit it at 100 miles an hour. And what we've seen is a lot of teams that aim for the middle of that tackle, when they get to that mesh, that running back almost has to bend it and hop outside. I teach the running backs that in case they have to, but I really don't want to have to do that unless we have to. Um, our tight end is not going to arc release on this. As you can see, he's going to combo that forte to the Mike linebacker. Um, tackle's basically going to block the four technique on his own. Our guard right here is going to, and this is an important key teaching point, we don't tell him just to release to linebacker. The play side guard has to step and almost make it look like we're triple teaming that four technique and then release for a couple reasons. Number one, because if this kid slants or angles hardcore into him and I just release that guard, then our quarterback's going to get destroyed. Number two, he's taught to stay square to the line, take a good power step, feel with that left arm, that left hand on that four technique, and then get the linebacker. Uh, because in case that linebacker blitzes, we can catch him right there. So we see a lot of that. So that's a really, really important coaching point. You really want to make sure that against a 52 look or a 53 look, um, any odd front, that, that play side guard makes look like a triple team and then get vertical. Center, again, can't be wrong. Just block the nose. He can base him out. He can base him in. It, it's really up to him. And then our backside guard and tackle are going to 45, which it doesn't look like they're doing on here. But they're really just, that guard is not going to go here. He's going to 45 hard on an angle. And he might catch this linebacker. He might not. Um, but I'm going to take my chances on my dive back running 100 miles an hour this way. Then him scraping across really hard and making a tackle inside three or four yards. If he's making that tackle, he's going to make that tackle five, six yards of field. And, and I'm okay with that if we have linemen that are struggling to get to him. So he's going to 45. He's going to 45. Our receiver is going to stock block like we've talked about before. Same pitch relationship, no different. I will say that with the running backs, especially with that pitch back, um, it is critical that you spend a lot of practice time with that mesh because the, the midline, the inside veer, the outside veer, those backfield actions are very different. And the running backs, these high school kids, especially when they're the pitch back, they want to treat them all the same way. And what you find is they can't all get there at the same time. Um, some issues we've had with our system, with our kids, is they want to step upfield and then bubble out. Well, now you're losing time because he is literally running down the line of scrimmage. And because he's running and you're going upfield and now bubbling, you're never going to get in a relationship with him. And my first couple of years here at Lakeview, our QBs didn't really want to pitch. Well, they didn't want to pitch because they couldn't see him. They would always come off the field, coach, I can't see the pitch. I don't want to step and pitch into nothing. I want to see what I'm pitching at. So we'll teach our pitch backs now throughout the, the summer, um, the, the early few weeks of practices, to really get a feel for where are you best at. You know, if, I, if this kid's got some speed, 
then you might be able to put him up over the guard a little bit more if his first step and second step are good and he can get outside because they got to sprint. It's not a jog. They got to go. They got to get in front so that QB can see them. We're going to be four to five yards out, about one yard back, but enough to where that QB has confidence to when he sees that pitch key, he can step, see the pitch man, and clear the path. If we want to pitch it, we want to run through because we don't want that QB getting hit by the pitch key. Um, but that takes a lot of practice time and, and a lot of issues, and you really want to iron those out so that QB has confidence to pitch that ball. We, we found in the past few years had a lot of success with our pitch game because of that. And one of the, one of the few negatives I've ever heard about the split bag veer is that there's no way that you guys can get to the pitch phase and outside veer. Well, there is a way. If that kid just goes and sprints hardcore, you can get to that pitch phase. I've had, as a, as a coaching staff here at Lakeview, we've had other teams tell us that we don't even cover your pitch key defensively because we know you can't get to the pitch phase. Well, just having that information, I mean, obviously you're going to want to get better at it. And then the exact same team the following year, we got to the pitch phase and ran for like 200 yards um, because you, you got to cover it. We can get to that pitch phase. It does take some time. It's not like a flex bone or a pistol where you're in motion and can get to that phase easy. You really got to go and you really got to get there. Um, play side, backside receivers, they're going to block the corner um, 95, 99% of the time. We're not going to switch this responsibility a whole awful lot, especially against this defense and on this play. This play is so, can be so pure and, and so perfect if you really put the time in to get it right. Um, it, it, it can really be a devastating play for defenses. Um, so, this is Pro 36. So, basically, this is same defense we've been talking about. This is a 52 look. Um, we got a tight end right here. He's not going to arc release like we talked about. They did – so they did modify this a little bit. So they do have a nose, but their, their fours became three techniques. So now our tight end pretty much knows. I don't have a combo. I can't help combo a three technique. So I'm going to pretty much get vertical to this linebacker right now. Our guard and tackle would end up having a double to linebacker. Our center would block the nose. And then our backside guys would 45. Um, so this – right here would end up being the dive key. More than likely, he is the pitch key, who nine times out of 10 in this play ends up taking himself out of the play because he's so worried about the pitch phase, he doesn't see the dive phase. And then we are untouched for a 60 yard touchdown. And so you can see, you know, this, this play hits super fast. Um, I will say a few things. Like the ball's right here on the – looks like the 40-yard line. Um, the issue is their heels are kind of far back. I don't like their heels at five. I want their heels at four. So imagine how fast this play hits if their heels are at four. And what I have found and what other teams have found is that teams, that running backs want to move up on outside veer because they are worried about the mesh, that they might not get there. So if they back up more, they feel like they can get to the mesh better but that you really got to prep rep that and, and make sure they move up and their heels are at four because this could be a, a devastatingly quick play. Um, pretty good mesh. The only issue with the QB is he works a little bit too far backwards. They really would need to be either flat or into the line. Um, notice how because he ran flat down the line, he doesn't give himself time to actually read this. I mean, he makes the right read. But if you worked into the line more and reached back, now the read becomes easier and you put number 10 here in a bind. So you can already tell number 10, QB does a great job with his eyes here. You can see number 10 has QB. QB knows it, gives the ball. Notice how his feet take him outside because he's thinking pitch. And before it's too late, he can't get to the dive back. And we're off to the races. So it's little things like that that we'll, we'll watch on film. Even a great play like that. There are ways that we can improve, and there's ways to get better. This is 37, so we're just coming on the other way. Um, different defensive look, um, but what we're really going to do here is probably going to end up, you know, double or comboing him, base him. He's going to release to linebacker. We're going to read him and pitch off on these DBs that come downfield. 
And you can see just how fast this play really hits. QB does a better job. The only issue right here is notice how the mesh has started and his back foot hasn't landed. So you really want that front foot up because you don't want to trip the running back with your front side foot. You want the, the yeah, the front side foot, you want your back side foot up here. His right leg should be up. Um, pretty good read though. He rides that mesh and he makes up for his lack of getting into the line by when he gets to the mesh. He actually like works his body into it more like that. So he gives that ball. But just in real time, you can see how fast that running back really gets there. It's it's for high school kids, if you can run this well, you you really, really put them in a bind. It's really hard to stop. Another outside beer, and then we'll talk a little bit about the counter option. This is 37. Uh, same concept. Tight end's gonna, these guys are gonna double. Tight end's gonna release to him. And because tight end releases to him, he's the dive key. There is no pitch key. It doesn't exist. They lined everybody up on the line. And we see this a lot too, that linebacker spins and then scrapes around over top. And so tight end realizes that and just releases him and goes upfield. And notice how, how quickly our running back gets to the line of scrimmage and gets vertical. Needs to be fast, need to go. Good mesh, run on the line, read, give, go, and get vertical. Uh, last play I'll touch on really quick is counter option, and then I can cover a few quick play action pass plays that we have. Uh, counter option I wanted to present because it's such a, a big part of what we do and how we do it. There's other things we can really do off it, um, but we like counter option because it's like a flex bone style offense or option play. Um, we block it, and the reason why I'm going to go over it is because we block it exactly the same as outside veer except for one lineman. So I teach it that way. Block counter option, block 42 and 43 like it's outside veer except for one guy. So notice how up front play side, we're going to combo to linebacker. Our play side guard is going to make it look like we're triple teaming going to linebacker. Center came from on that nose. Our backside guard is going to pull. And we'll get to why here in a minute. But he's going to pull and get upfield. We're going to sell. The action, the backfield action is going to start looking like inside beer, and then we're going to come back. So our L back is going to sell like it's 31 or 35. He's going to get this way, and he's going to end up whoever fills this gap right here. He's not going to get the ball unless we tag it with like a trap if we wanted to. Then the L back would get it. But he's going to fill the vacated spot by the guard. The R back's going to take two or three steps like he's running the pitch. So one, two, three, and then bubble out, come back for the option. QB's footwork changes a lot. So he's going to hop off the line, which you'll see here shortly. He's going to hop backwards off the line, and he's going to put the ball in front of the L back like he would actually be giving the ball. We're not going to really turn our feet, but we are going to turn our shoulders. We don't turn the feet because I don't want to have to have that QB do a full 360 and come back around. So he's not turning his feet. He's hopping backwards but he's still going to turn his shoulders and drop the ball and put the ball on the table for the L back. Once the L clears the path, he's going to push off his backside foot. So the QB in this sense would push off his left foot and he's going to run this way. And our, our pitch key, because there is no dive key, it's a double option, is the end. That can change if we tag it. So you look up top, it says tags for arc or base. If I, count, if I called, this would be pro. So if I call pro 42 base, then we're not going to send him on a combo anymore. We're going to base that in, and then we're going to pitch off of the first available threat that shows. The guard has the, the hardest block, I think, in our entire system. And I say that because he's going to pull and get to about here. He cannot touch the end. If the end stays right where he's at, he's going to run right around him like the diagram shows. If the end flies upfield, he has to do everything he can to avoid him. We don't want to touch the end. That's really hard for linemen to do. Even the best linemen really struggle with either they're really good at it and they can avoid him, or for whatever reason, they want to put a hand on him while they go. We don't want to slow him down. We want him moving. We want him to go. So we're going to pull that guard, get upfield just as an extra blocker. 
because in our system, we don't see a whole lot of defenses reading linemen. We see defenses reading QBs and running backs. Um, so same stuff I just said in these slides over here. Again, and I can share this slideshow with anyone that's interested. Um, I just thought it'd be easier if I explained it here and then show some films. I know I'm running a little bit out of time. So uh, counter option, some examples of it. So this is Pro 42. Sorry, this is Khan actually. So I saw that dab and it's hard to see. And you can kind of see how quick that option actually hits as far as what the action is in the backfield. You'll see the L back come down here. Guard's gonna pull. And it's a really quick pitch because the end flies up field right now. So we, that's why we teach our QB not to turn his feet. Because if you turn your feet and then come back around, you might not see that coming. You might get destroyed. Quick pitch, great pitch right here on the edge. Get up field, get vertical. Pro 42. Again, we're going to block it just like outside here on this side. Guard's going to pull lead up. L back is going to sell dive. Pitch back to take a few steps, come back, and he's going to run that double option with the QB. So you can kind of see how he hops off the line. Notice how far he hops off the line because that guard is pulling, and we need to make sure that we, we give him some space to do what he needs to do. Notice how the guard does a great job of avoiding the end. Don't touch him. He sees that now. He could have stayed a little bit tighter here, but he sees that now and gets vertical. I would argue the QB should have pitched the ball, but he didn't. Follows his guard, get up field. Pretty good athletic play. And, and the reason why we like this play so much is because it really, it really puts defenses in a bind. You can't, you can't stop cut back inside of your outside of your and counter option and all have the same read keys. You, you just can't because we're going to, we're going to come at you at different angles. So this is 43, and then I'll get some passing game. Um, basically, now the R back is going to sell that dive. The L is going to take three steps to come back. We're going to block up front here, just like outside beer. Pretty good job by the, the QB right here. Doesn't turn his feet. Um, notice how he kind of hops under his right foot. That's okay. Um, he's turning his shoulders, making it look like a, like a true mesh. Notice how the defense goes with it. Guard had a hard time avoiding the end, like he should have. So, and that was one of my better guards that year too. So that guard sprints down. He doesn't really see a path to clear. Like I think he wanted to go here. And so he goes to hit him and he should have just tried to avoid him as best he can. So we have to make a quick pitch over here. And that's why that play, and then the guard pulls and kicks out the end. That's why that play is so important to have as far as having a lineman that can really read that block and understand why you need to avoid him. Because he almost muddies that play. But luckily he gets that block right there and that kind of helps save everything. So last two things that we talked about pretty quickly are our passing game. Um, and I've only got a few examples of those. Our passing game is pretty simple. Um, we go by hundreds and two hundreds. So a play action with a hundred tells the QB he's on the line. So 134 means he's going to keep his fake on the line. And we're going to sell 34 action. Wherever route we have play side, we're going to have that route backside. Um, if I had a tight end in here, even though he's out here, if he was right here, he would block too. He has no route. Um, but because he's out here in the slot in our east open look, then he's going to run a bubble. Um, the, the key coaching points for this, um, QB is going to buzz his feet or he's going to three-step and stay low on the action, make it look like we're running inside beer. Throw on the route break, we run a three-step slant, so then third steps, throw it. Running back, sell the inside beer look. Our offensive line is going to power step away from the play action, um, but we're going to teach big on big. So if it's like a 52, you're going to block the man on you or you're looking for linebacker. Wide receivers are going to 
mirror their combo. So if the X has a slant, the Z is going to have a slant. We can run a backside route the other way. If the tight end is in, he's going to max protect. Um, pretty basic play action. We don't have much out of the 100 series. We have slant, which is a huge play for us. Um, we have a, a bubble. We call it Raven right here where the, where the wide receiver would actually get the ball. Same action from the QB. We don't necessarily – we can't throw back to the X on 134 slant because he's moving this way. He can't just turn and throw that way. Um, but we can call slant back and sell that action and then come back and throw it to the X. Um, ride pass, this is adapted from JT Curtis as well. Um, but it's a 200 series. So 200 series means the QB is going to be off the line. So we're going to fake – this is actually 235 ride pass. But he's going to fake – his inside rear look, and then he's going to three-step drop like every other team would in a normal drop. Um, our running backs are going to sell inside rear. Our receivers are going to run underneath routes. I don't tell them what to run. They can run curls. They can run hitches. And then this is where that three-step arc release comes into play from inside and outside rear. Or I'm sorry, inside rear and cutback. Three-step arc release and run to where the safety's not. That's why we arc release our tight ends on those plays. Um, oftentimes they have huge critical blocks for us, but more often than not, it's just to set up the ride pass. So some coaching points, it's a two-step inside rear fake, and then a three-step drop, so reach cross plant like you would in any other offense. Um, running back sell inside rear, same O-line blocking scheme. We don't change any of that stuff. We are not a big cut blocking team um, for multiple reasons, most importantly because we're not very good at it. Um, wide receivers run the underneath route. We don't send our receivers on a deep route with the ride pass because we are concerned that they will take that defensive corner with them when they run that route to take the tight end. We don't want to help them cover that play. We want to make sure that we sell that underneath look. And we just teach the tight end to run with the safety's not. So a lot of times we'll run that action towards the run fake because we think that safety is going to come down for pitch. And so we're going to send our tight end literally right past him to, to get that ball. And then lastly is our slogan, slam, same play action look. Um, we're going to fake inside veer. Running backs are going to fake 34. It's just our slant and fade. Um, nothing really changes here. It's the same 200 action. Um, running back still inside veer. Slogan is a big route for us because once we sell that slant and that corner wants to bite, and we have a safety that wants to play aggressively on the option. Now we know maybe they'll hit him with that slow go with that slant and fade. Um, again, tight end has no route on this. And I think that's the beauty of our passing game. You know, we don't have a whole lot of three, four man combos. We're going to keep it pretty basic two, two man routes, one man routes if we go two tight ends. Um, we're not afraid to do that because we feel like we can put those defenses in a bind with what we do and how we do it with having to take our dive QB and our, our pitch keys. Um, so lastly is a few examples of these plays. So this is slant. Uh, this is 134 slant. Uh, these hit super fast, step, throw the ball, and get up field. Um, a lot of times these break for touchdowns. Um, it's so fast. Notice the QB takes the ball. Um, he really should have it seated still. We do we do rep that seated position. I don't really want it here because what if this kid gets blown up into the ball? We really want that ball seated. But he buzzes his feet, sees the break, throws the ball. Um, pretty easy blocking system. The player takes about two seconds to develop. Um, pretty pretty easy to put in and install. This is the same play coming the other way, 134 slant. Close your feet, throw. And this kid actually was a kid that – this was his first game at QB because our other kid got hurt. And so this was one of the first and only pass plays we had the entire game because all I had to do was – like notice how his footwork's kind of bad. He kind of hops down and his shoulders are square. Not really selling that inside veer game, but he could throw relatively well enough to, to throw a slant. And it hits so quick. I mean, you can see every guy they have in the box feels like option is coming, and they all get downhill. And because they all come downhill, that really opens up the slant path for him. 
This is that tight end ride pass. So we're going to take a two-step inside veer fake, three-step drop. These guys will sell our inside veer look, and we're going to throw it right back to him. The coaching point for a 200 series play, when the back foot hits on that three-step drop, throw the ball. So release it. So one, two, one, two, three, throw the ball. Not always that open where there's not one safety to worry about, but a lot of times that safety is already committed to the pitch, and that's why we tell him the minute that you get to that back foot, hop up, throw the ball. And we teach our passing system how to pass footwork, very similar to every other team that does it, except we're going to fake some inside rear before we do it. Plant, throw the ball. Lastly is slow go. This is one of the few times where we actually teach our QB to throw it to the play side, to throw it to where the play action fake went, because our QBs are usually right-handed. So we're going to look here first and then look here. Um, I put this in because this footwork is not great, but it's still 36-yard play. So what you see here is we used to teach our running backs to take three steps and then attack the edge. This season we were getting a lot of pressure from this kid, from these guys coming downhill on our passing game. So we told him to take three steps and then come back. His issue is he should have actually attacked the edge and not just stood there. QB takes a few more steps and then he kind of hops around and then throws it off his back foot and somehow completes it. But I put this in because of how open this kid actually is. He runs a pretty good slow go. And then you can see he was pretty open down here. And we could easily throw him that ball if we have good slow work and a good play action fake. A lot of things could have been accomplished from that play. Good blocking, but again, just something that, you know, you watch this film and you see the defense, they all go to the option because they feel like option's coming. And there's only four guys that understand that it's not coming. And you can get really big plays that way. So um, do you guys ever run your uh, inside veer to the two-man surface? I saw most of the time you ran it to the tight end side. Do you ever run it to the two-man surface? We do. Um, so we'll run it to the, not to like a 52 look, but in, in where we're at in Michigan, we see a lot of 52, we see a lot of split four. Um, and so we'll actually run it to the two man service in a split four look. Um, and I think that, you know, especially with that East and West open look, when we have three receivers, it doesn't really matter which side we're going to go to. Um, that's usually a really big play for us against the defense like that. Um, I guess the 52 kind of defense, like we were talking about, we'll usually run a lot of two tight end look. Um, yeah. Just because I want to have the outside beer aspect of it. I can't run outside beer without a tight end. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you said your youth program runs split back beer. So do they run the option and the quarterbacks learn to read it? Yeah, so basically what we do, even with the real little kids, the third and fourth, fifth and sixth grade, we teach them cutbacks. Um, we teach them plays called four and five. Four and five are like their belly. They block it. Everybody just blocks man on. But four and five looks just like 34 and 35. And so it really helps to teach that QB to get his eyes where they need to be. There's no read for him, just give the ball. There's still a pitch key, but there's no read. It's just a straight belly give, which gives them the confidence when they get to the higher levels. Now I can read it. Our seventh and eighth grade, um, some of our fifth and sixth grade, they run, they, they have at least two actual read plays, usually inside beer. Um, they struggle to get the outside here because they really can't run it to get to that mesh. Um, last year they learned midline and did really well running midline, which was really good for them. So That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So, Coach, I can't thank you enough for coming on and presenting for us. And, um, yeah, it was awesome. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. Yep.